Hello, my name is Jeff Messier. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering in the Schulich School of Engineering at the University of Calgary. And this is module 10 in my computer networks lecture series where we dive into a little bit more detail um, regarding the stop and wait ARQ algorithm. Now, if you've just finished watching module 9, uh, where we talked about the, the sliding window protocol, stop and wait ARQ is really a, a simpler kind of special case of the sliding window protocol where um, we have a transmit window of one. So that means only one frame can be outstanding at one time. And we have a receive window of zero. So that means the receiver doesn't buffer any out of order frames. And sort of the effect of this is a very kind of simple protocol where the transmitter sends one frame and waits for an acknowledgement for that frame. If it doesn't get the ACK, it just keeps resending that frame until the ACK arrives, then it moves on to the next frame. And because we have this very small window size, it turns out that we can get away with um, one bit sequence numbers. So our sequence number is just equal to either zero or one. And we're gonna go through some examples to kind of prove that to you. And uh, I'm also gonna use these examples to introduce a couple of new concepts. So first of all, I'm going to introduce a scenario where we have our transmitter and receiver getting out of sync with each other. And this is sometimes known as an ambiguity scenario where, you know, due to uh, processing delay at the receiver, an act gets sent a little bit late and kind of gets sort of cross, um, crossed up with uh, a retransmission of a new frame. So we'll, I'll introduce this notion of ambiguity. Then we're going to work through an example using single bit sequence numbers to show that the single bit sequence number is sufficient to deal with this ambiguity scenario. And in that example, I'm also going to introduce the concept of using state machines to represent the operation of a protocol. Okay, so we're going to use our sort of time, the same kind of timeline diagram that we used in uh, module nine to illustrate this ambiguity scenario. And we've got node one transmitting information frames to node two and node two replying with acknowledgements. And in this first sort of ambiguity example, I'm going to assume that uh, we're not using sequence numbers at all, right? So um, this first information frame, I'm just going to, oops, simply call frame number one. And the ACK, I'm just gonna call an ACK. So the ACK doesn't have any sequence number in it. And this could in theory work to a limited extent. So for example, we can send our information frame and because this is stop and wait ARQ, we only ever send one information frame at a time, so we're not going to have out of order frames. And, you know, the transmitter, since it only has one outstanding frame, when it receives the acknowledgement, knows that that should be for the outstanding frame. So on the surface of it, this appears like it might work. However, we do run into some problems when this system gets out of sync, and I'll illustrate how that can that could happen. So. Frame number one has worked correctly. We sent the frame and we've received the acknowledgement. So now let's move on to transmit frame number two. Oops. Do that. Sorry, I'll get this figured out here. All right, so we're gonna send frame number two. 
frame number two arrives successfully, but let's say the receiver um, is not ready for whatever reason to send the acknowledgement back immediately. Maybe the processor that is managing the ARQ protocol also is responsible for other tasks and those tasks have preempted the processing of the received frame. And so remember, you know, with all ARQ protocols, we, uh, the transmitter will start a timer after sending the frame. And if the timer expires before we receive the acknowledgement, the frame is simply retransmitted. So let's say, this is the expiry time for our timer. And let's say that duration of time passes before the acknowledgement is received. So what's going to happen is the, um, the frame is going to get retransmitted. So that's frame number two getting retransmitted. But, you know, as, you know, this frame is getting retransmitted, let's say now that the receiver finally gets around to processing its acknowledgement. But the acknowledgement lines up in time. Whoops. I'll just move that one more time, get it lined up better. The acknowledgement ends up looking something like this. So, you know, at, at this point in time, the receiver finally gets around to you know, processing the received frame, checking the CRC, everything's good, so it sends its acknowledgement back. But because it takes a certain finite amount of time for these frames to be sent, the ACK and frame number two actually cross each other. So while the ACK is being sent and received, frame number two is actually being sent and received as well. And so from frame or so from the from the transmitter's perspective this acknowledgement arrives and it says great i'm going to send um, the next frame frame number my retransmission obviously came through and so it's going to send frame number 3 but in this case let's say that frame number 3 does not arrive And that's fine. I mean, that's the whole purpose for the ACK mechanism, right? So, you know, we, we should retransmit frame number three. However, let's take a look at what's happening at the receiver. So at this point, at this point, we sent our acknowledgement for the first transmission of frame number two. The receiver, however, is going to send an acknowledgement every time it receives a frame. So once it receives the second copy of frame number two, it's going to send another acknowledgement. So what's going to happen 
that acknowledgement is actually going to cross over and arrive after the transmission of frame number three. So at this point, the transmitter receives an, an acknowledgement after sending frame number three. So what's happened is this ACK that is sent here is actually in response to the second reception of frame number two. But because we're now out of sync, it arrives after the transmission of frame number three and the transmitter, because we're not using sequence numbers here, has no choice but to say, oh, okay, that was a pretty fast ACK, but I guess finally I'm getting some decent service now out of the receiver. And the transmitter is gonna assume that frame number three has been received correctly as well. And so its next transmission will actually be of frame number four. And frame number three will never ever get retransmitted. Now, you could maybe step back from this example and look at it and say, uh, you know, like how likely is this? Um, you know, we had a little bit of a delay for the second act and it happened that, you know, if I just change colors here, you know, this act that I'm circling in green just happened to be delayed at exactly the right amount that it arrived, you know, just after the transmission of frame number three. And if it had been even a little bit sooner, you know, it, it wouldn't have happened that way. And you're right, like, you know, you could imagine many ways that this wouldn't happen. But this highlights one of the um, you know, kind of fundamental tenets of protocol design. And that is we have to design our protocols to be ro robust against even very rare events. And the reason for that, again, is because we just send such a vast number of information. So many billions and trillions of packets are sent over the internet every day. And every time we send a packet, you can imagine that we're sort of rolling the dice. We're performing an experiment. And, you know, if we've got this kind of strange case in our protocol that could cause it to fail, every time we send a packet, it's like we're performing another random experiment to see if we can create just those perfect conditions to have a failure case. And if you keep rolling the dice and rolling the dice trillions of times every day, you can bet that sooner or later the conditions will be perfect to have your protocol fail in this way. And this is even, we have to be even more careful about this kind of um, design flaw because it's very, very hard to recreate this if you are a designer. So if this is how your, um, you know, if this is how your protocol is failing in the field, recreating this in the lab because you have to recreate just these very special strange conditions is super, super hard. And so as designers, we need to be, you know, we need as much as possible to try and anticipate these unusual cases. So what we're going to do next is I'm going to redo this example with stop and wait ARQ using a single bit sequence number. And we're going to sort of see if we can, if a single bit sequence number is sufficient to um, catch and uh, sort of accommodate this kind of, of ambiguity scenario. Okay, so this, um, this is where we're gonna, gonna do our example with our single bit sequence number. And we're actually gonna spend a fair bit of time on this example because there's quite a bit to, to talk about. Now, first of all, one of the things that we're gonna introduce that's new in this example is this notion of representing the operation of a protocol as a state machine. Now, the state machine I've got represented in sort of the lower right-hand corner of the slide here. It has four states, state A, B, C, and D. And the transitions between those states occur when a particular event happens. So in order to transmit from state A to state B, 
Node 2 needs to receive an information frame with sequence number 0. In order to trans in order to make a, a state transition between state B and C, node 1 needs to receive an acknowledgement with sequence number 1 containing sequence number 1. And uh, I've got a little bit of a typo here. This should be node 1, and this should be node 1, because node 2 is going to be receiving the information frames, and of course node 1 receives the acknowledgments. In order to make a transition from state C to D, node 2 needs to receive an information frame with sequence number 1, and in order to make a transition from state D to A, back to A, Node 1 needs to receive an acknowledgement that contains sequence number 0. And if you remember from module 9, the acknowledgement always contains the sequence number of the frame that the receiver is expecting next, right? So um, it makes sense that when we go from, from A to B, we're sending um, information frame with the sequence number of 0. Once the receiver gets sequence number 0, it's going to tell the transmitter that it's now expecting sequence number one. So that's why it's acknowledgement contains number one. When we move from, once we receive frame one, we're then gonna tell the transmitter that we're expecting frame zero. And that's how we sort of move around this, this state machine. If you remember, we've got a number of variables that the transmitter and the receiver will keep track of. So we've got NTX, which is the, we've got NTX and NA, which are stored in the transmitter. NTX is the sequence number of the frame that the transmitter is gonna send next. NA is the sequence number that the transmitter of the most recent acknowledgement received by the transmitter. And in the receiver, we have NRX, and NRX is the sequence number of the frame that the receiver is expecting next. We've also got NS, but NS actually doesn't come into play in stop and wait ARQ because NS is for buffering out of order frames and we don't allow that to happen in stop and wait. And so if you see, if you take a look at our, our state machine, state A is when NRX is zero and NA is equal to zero. So we've got one variable that's stored in the receiver, one variable that's stored in the transmitter. State B is when NRX is one and NA is zero. State C is when both of the values are one and state D is when NA is one and NRX is zero. And so as we move through the operation of stop and wait and as we sort of exchange um, frames between nodes one and two between the transmitter and the receiver I'm actually also going to in parallel kind of take a look at the state machine and observe how we progress through the state machine as we exchange frames okay so let's begin let's assume that our protocol when it initializes starts out in state a of the state machine and we're gonna do exactly the same packet exchange that we had in our ambiguity example on the previous slide. And so the first exchange we're gonna start out with is a totally normal receive the information frame reply with an acknowledgement. And so we're gonna transmit our first frame and this is frame number one, and it's gonna have a sequence number of zero. So that's kind of my shorthand. Um, for the, the first frame we transmit and its sequence number is equal to zero. So you'll notice that, or well, and then what we're gonna do At a number of time points in this packet exchange, and I'm going to define these time points, you know, with this um, vertical gray line, we're going to basically sort of freeze the 
protocol stack and take a look at the status of all the different variables that are, we're keeping track of. And so the variables that are important for us in the transmitter is NTX, which is the sequence number that we're going to be sending, or in the frame that we're going to be sending next, and NA, which is the value of the most recent acknowledgement received by the transmitter. And in the receiver, node 2, the variable that we care about is NRX. Again, we're not bothering with NS because we can't buffer out of order frames. And so at this first point in um, defined by this gray line, we've received our first frame with sequence number zero. And so NRX is always the sequence number that we expect next. And so the value of NRX at this point is equal to one. NTX is the sequence number of the frame that we're gonna be sending next. And so its value is also equal to one. And NA we don't have any value for because we haven't received our acknowledgement yet. If we look down at our, our state machine, we started out in state A. And we make a transition from state A to state B when node two receives a frame with sequence number zero. That's happened. And so at this point, represented by the gray line, we are whoops, now in state B in our state machine. Okay, so the next thing that happens once we've received our information frame is for node two to send an acknowledgement back to node one. Oops, no, that's not what we want to grab. And in this case, these acknowledgements will contain sequence numbers. And the number returned by the receiver to the transmitter is going to be the value of NRX, which is the sequence number one. And so now if we again sort of take a snapshot in time of what our system or how our system is doing, The next frame to be transmitted is still sequence number one. We've now, however, received an acknowledgement, which has a value of one. So NA is equal to one. NRX is still equal to one. And um, we've experienced a change in our state machine. So in state B, State B is defined by the receiver having a value of NRX equal to one and the transmitter having an acknowledgement value of zero. And actually, I guess I should, I said earlier that NA is undefined. Actually, it really should be zero, right? Because we assumed that we started out in state A in our state machine. So when we're in state B, NA is equal to zero However, as soon as node one receives an acknowledgement with a sequence value of one, then we make a transition to state C. So at our new time point, we're in state C of our state machine. Our next step now is to send our second information frame. This is going to be frame number two. And it's going to have a sequence number of one. And if we take a snapshot of our system at this time point, since we've transmitted frame number one, 
the next frame to, or the next sequence number to use as far as our transmitter is concerned is sequence number zero. Remember, we're using only a single bit sequence number, so we immediately wrap around back down to zero. We still, the most recent ACK we've received is still sequence number one. And now in our receiver, because we've received sequence number zero, the next sequence number expected by our receiver is zero. If we take a look down at our state machine, we were in state number three, defined as the point where NRX and NA are both equal to one. We make our state transition when node two receives a frame with sequence number one. And now we're in state D, which is defined as the state where NRX is equal to zero and NA is equal to one. And so at this point in our example, we're in state D of our state machine. So now we get to the point where we get crossed up in our example. So we receive frame number two, but for whatever reason, node one due to processor load or something like that is a little bit slow getting the acknowledgement frame back to node one. And so what happens at node one is the retransmission timer expires and node one resends frame number two. However, just as node two or node one is resending, frame number two, node one finally gets around to sending that acknowledgement and we get crossed up. Let me see if I can just, actually I wanna make sure I'm gonna keep enough room in our diagram here. Okay, so just to make some notes on the diagram now, this acknowledgement contained sequence number zero, and this is a retransmission of frame number two, which contains sequence number one. And Actually, let me just in the interest of sort of preserving space. This is a retransmission of frame number two with sequence number one. Okay, so let's take another snapshot in time. So if we make a snapshot in time, the next frame that the transmitter wants to send is still sequence number zero. The most recent acknowledgement received by the transmitter is now sequence number zero. And the next data frame expected by the receiver is also zero. So if we take a look at our state machine, should have erased that. So if we take a look at our state machine, we were in state D. We have received an acknowledgement with sequence zero at node number one. And so we've now made the transition back to state A. You'll notice that this retransmission of frame number two with sequence number one actually didn't really affect our state machine at all, right? The, the transition that we made from D to A is contingent only on receiving that acknowledgement and 
you know, the fact that a frame has been retransmitted or we've received a frame more than once doesn't influence the, the transition. And so now at this point, we're back to state A. Okay, so now I've added three packet transmissions here. So let's go through each one. So we've received our retransmitted frame number two. And the first thing that the receiver is going to do is acknowledge the reception of the retransmission. So every time a frame is received by the receiver, regardless of whether it's a retransmission, an acknowledgement is generated. And that acknowledgement is always going to contain the value of NRX. So we sent an acknowledgement use a different color. So we sent an acknowledgement here to acknowledge the reception of the first frame number two, even though we were a little bit late. And now we're going to send another acknowledgement to acknowledge the second reception of frame number two. And so this ACK is acknowledging this, the second reception of frame number two, and it's still going to contain the sequence value of zero because that is what the, um, that is what the receiver is expecting. Now, as far as the transmitter is concerned, the transmitter knew at this point that frame number two had been received. And so now it's getting ready to transmit frame number three. And so this transmission, is frame number three with a sequence number of zero. And this first transmission of frame number three, just like the previous example, gets lost, it gets corrupted and doesn't arrive. So before this caused a problem because the acknowledgement, the second acknowledgement that we sent got crossed up with frame number three. And then at this point, when we weren't using sequence numbers, the transmitter misinterpreted that ACK as being for frame number three. But now it knows it's not, right? Because we just transmitted with sequence number zero and the ACK also contains sequence number zero. If it was acknowledging sequence number zero, the ACK would have contained a one. And because it doesn't, the transmitter knows that the ACK is not for its most current transmitted frame. And then when it resends its frame, this is still frame number three. So this is the point where um, everything comes right and the transmitter realizes that this sort of crossed up acknowledgement is not for frame number three. Frame number three has not been received and so it retransmits frame number three, again with a sequence number of zero. And so if we look at a point in time in our protocol, at this point, the, trans the next frame the transmitter wants to send is frame number one or sequence number one we still have most recently just received an acknowledgement with sequence number zero. And down here, now that um, frame number three with sequence zero has been um, received, the next sequence number expected by the transmitter is, or by the receiver is sequence number one. And if we take a look at our state machine, we were in state A, once we receive a, an information frame with sequence number zero, right, which occurs at this point, we make our transition to state B. So at this point in the timeline, we are in state B. And all of this kind of retransmission of the acts and the failed reception of frame number three doesn't affect our state machine at all. Our state machine only makes a transition when we successfully receive our information frame, specifically with a sequence number of zero. And so hopefully at this point in the example, you can kind of see that
you know, the the way that this state machine works is it just sort of stays in a current state and it's looking for something specific to happen in order to, or in order to make the transition to the next state. And if, you know, other things are sort of going on around it, it doesn't affect the state machine. The state machine only makes its transition when the specific conditions it's looking for have occurred. So just to finish off our example now, once node two has received frame number three, it sends an acknowledgement back to node one. And um, my apologies, I think maybe in this example, I've been mistaking nodes one and two, but of course node one is the transmitter, node two is the receiver. Um, the diagrams are obviously all correct, but apologies if I've maybe misspoke a few points in, during, the, uh, during the example. Um, but anyways, so node two sends an acknowledgement back to node one, and the ACK always contains the current value of NRX, which is the sequence number that node two is expecting next. So we send back an ACK containing the sequence number one. And then if we kind of capture the state of our system at one last point in time, the sequence number the transmitter is expecting to send next is equal to one. We've received an acknowledgement containing the sequence number one. The receiver is expecting sequence number one and then if we look at our state diagram, we were in state B and we've received an ACK from node one, or node one, sorry, receives an ACK containing a sequence number one. That means we transition to the state where NA and NRX are both equal to one. And so our final state is state C. And you know, again, one of the things to notice about this state diagram is that, you know, there can be a lot of things going on in the example. There can be retransmissions of frames, dropped frames, but state transitions only occur when a very specific set of conditions um, are met. And, and this kind of helps us with overall protocol design, right? And, you know, it helps us in a way avoid these strange kind of ambiguity situations where our protocol breaks down. If we if we make our protocol robust so that we have a particular state and we only progress to the next state of operation when, you know, particular, you know, when a well-specified list of conditions are met, then it tends to lead us to a hopefully more robust protocol. So one of the questions that I sometimes get at this point is where is this stop and wait ARQ state machine implemented. And you might be thinking this way, particularly if you have an electrical or a computer engineering background and you've seen state diagrams before and you've implemented them with, you know, some sort of sequential logic circuit with flip-flops and or, or something like that. And what I want to emphasize is that the... Um, the state machine is really just meant to kind of conceptually represent the transmitter and receiver working together. When you actually implement stop and wait ARQ, it's done with a little piece of software on the transmitter and a little piece of software on the receiver. And pretty straightforward actually, um, just from a, from a coding perspective. And so this pseudocode that um, I've written down here, so represents the, the transmitter and the receiver. So node one um, is basically the transmitter. Node two is the receiver. And we start in the transmitter by initializing uh, a little counter variable ITX, and then we enter an infinite loop. We send um, a frame with sequence number equal to our little counter ITX, and then we set a timer. Over here in the receiver, we have another little counter variable, IRX. We enter an infinite loop. And then we just sort of wait um, for, um, we wait for 
the reception, and I guess we should probably have wait for received frame. And um, when we receive the frame, if the frame is equal to um, what we're expecting, IRX, then we pass the frame up to a higher layer and we increment our little counter variable modulo two. And then we send an acknowledgement with um, the value of IRX. If the frame is not the sequence number that we um, expect, we don't change IRX and we send an acknowledgement with the frame that we are expecting. So that's where the, um, you know, the rejection of um, incorrect frames comes from. And then over here in the transmitter, we set a timer. And if we receive an acknowledgement that's um, not equal to the, our, the current value of our counter, that means the receiver has received the frame that it wanted and it's asking for the next one. And so we get a new data frame and we increment our, um, our counter variable. So not, not, maybe not ex like this, the pseudocode isn't perfect because I'm kind of glossing over like a bunch of sort of timing related and reception issues, but hopefully just at a very high level, this will give you an idea of how you could implement stop and wait ARQ in software. And the, and the main thing I'm trying to get across with this slide is to just show you that the, um, we're not implementing this, the state machine per se, we're basically sort of separating the transmitter and receiver functionality. And like all protocols, implementing it in software, a little bit of software on the transmitter, a little bit of software on the receiver.